Uh, my name is Michael Helms. I am a filmmaker and videographer. My intended goal with speaking with the students was to communicate to them what a vision is, uh, the meaning of vision, uh, what it all entails, uh, and how to communicate that vision. I really love the idea of passing things along that you've learned to students, because like, when I was, when I was younger, I would have, you know, I would have killed for that opportunity just to hear somebody talk about it who does it, you know, and that would have given me so much confidence to say, hey, if this person who's standing in front of me can do it, I can do it. So it's the number one reason I think is the students because they deserve to know, especially if they have a pool in them for it, um, to be encouraged not to veer away from it to be encouraged to go into it, um, if that's really what they want. How do you feel about getting a formal education and being self-taught? I think there are, there are major positives with both. Positives of being self-taught are, there's a certain amount of pride that goes with it. Um, pride in the work that you put into it, into figuring it out yourself. There's something to that that's like, I did this, you know. I didn't think I could do it at some point, but I actually did it and I taught myself how to do something. The positive as far as going to school is that I had the opportunity to meet a lot of filmmakers and a lot of people who have worked in the, the Hollywood system over the years and I had chances to go off on internships. If you're self-taught, you can still move to LA, you can still move to Atlanta, uh, you can still move to where films are being made and make films. You just have to get to know people, you have to network. So school is not the only way. And if you're determined, if you're driven, you can find people to work with and get your foot in the door. There are tons of people working in the film industry who are self-taught. Me personally, I'm glad I did it because it taught me a lot. It's, it showed me the path I could take. Uh, and it gave me, yeah, I guess repeating the same thing. It gave me a road to follow. It gave me a road map and I needed that. Never stop learning. Never think you've hit your ceiling, because you haven't. Uh, never think that you're good enough at this, because maybe you're not. Maybe you need to be better. And there needs to be, you need to be able to criticize yourself, even harshly sometimes, about your work in order to get better. You're never as good as you can be, and you're never as bad as you think you are. Just keep getting better and keep working. So what is your professional title? Um, filmmaker, videographer. Uh, there's a distinction between the two. Uh, filmmaking is more of making, making short films, feature length films kind of things, narrative films. Videography is more uh, working with businesses and doing weddings and things like that. What steps did you take to get here? Are you self-taught, technical school, apprenticeship, or did you go to college? Uh, kind of a mixture of self-taught and film school. <clears throat> I went to UNC School of the Arts for four years, from 2012 to 2016, got my Bachelor of Fine Arts in filmmaking. My concentration was in directing, uh, but I also learned uh, screenwriting, producing, um, everything, like from production assistant all the way up to executive producer. So. At film school, I learned how to do everything. So I got my hands on a lot of films and a lot of filmmaking. So um, as far as the self-taught thing, I'm teaching myself things every day. So like I'm constantly learning. Like I know probably three or four times as much as I knew you know, when I was in film school, you know, maybe even more. So in that way, I'm self-taught also. And self-taught also by doing it rather than just reading about it, yeah. What does your day-to-day -day look like being a um, filmmaker yeah. or videographer? Uh, it's, it's different from day-to-day, -day, but I can take today kind of as an example. Um, today I was burning DVDs for a play I filmed. Um, I come here to do this uh, and shooting. 
Later, I'll go home and probably do some editing, upload the footage online, I mean, on my uh, hard drive. Um, but if I'm working with a client, like my day-to-day -day would be, okay, I wake up, I have all my gear prepared the night before, all my batteries charged, et cetera. And then the next day I'll go to the site of where I'm shooting, I'll shoot for several hours, go home, upload all the footage, and then just leave it alone. And then the next day or the next few days after that, I will comb through everything and then start editing. Is that simple enough? Cool. Tell us about your work and why is it, why is it essential? <sighs> okay, so to say why it's essential is kind of tough. I mean, it's, it's subjective. To me, I, f I feel like storytelling is like inherent in everyone. Like, so it's important in that it helps people to understand or grasp the world around them uh, in, you know, kind of like art imitates life kind of thing. Uh, I guess it's the same thing for photography, visual art and everything like that. But with filmmaking, people really connect with stories that are told. And you all know that because you watch movies and you watch TV shows. So I think it's, I guess it's pretty simple. Yeah. What advice would you give us if we wanted to enter the field? Don't. No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> Um, okay, if you, if you want to enter filmmaking, um, the biggest thing is learn, learn, learn. Read a lot about it, um, watch a lot of videos, teach yourself things. If you want to go to college, go to college, which was very helpful for me personally because I gained a million contacts that way. I uh, had the opportunity to intern on many different films. Um, also, Let's see, watch movies, like never stop watching movies or television shows, uh, even the bad ones. Uh, that will teach you a lot. Watching the bad movies will actually teach you more than watching the good ones, I think, at least for me, uh, because you learn what not to do and what you could have done better. So does that answer it all right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for Yeah. Uh, we're going to give this portion over to you. All right. Um, and you'll take over the class and their sketchbook Okay. Practice. Hi everybody, my name is Michael Helms. Um, okay, filmmaking videography. Um, I'm not gonna say much about what I do, except those are just three shots from films of mine. The one on the left is a Revolutionary War short film. That's just the musket firing. The middle one is a shot of a couple after their wedding. I shoot a lot of weddings, which I find to be very fulfilling and I love doing it. Some filmmakers hate doing it, but I, I really enjoy it. And the next one is a short film I'm working on right now called Let It End Here, and that's a, a kind of a teaser poster for it. Uh, that's about a 40 minute film, the one for the poster on the right. And uh, we're gonna have a public screening of that before too long. I can give you the information. Uh, so yeah. Okay, I wanna start with a couple of quotes that I think are very meaningful and actually helped me quite a bit. And even if I'm feeling like I'm in a little bit of a rut creatively, it's really fun to just kind of see quotes from other filmmakers. And I think it's important for in any other forms of art also. Uh, so James Cameron said, pick up a camera, shoot something. Now you're a director. That, I mean, that's simplifying it quite a bit, but it's, it's very true. Everything after that, you're just negotiating your budget and your fee. Well, to go along with that, you also need, you know, people to help you. Uh, so Orson Welles said, a poet needs a pen, a painter, a brush, and a director in army. And that is very, very true, and it's also a big headache. But it's worth it. When you find a bunch of people you can work with and collaborate with, they're the ones that help you bring your story to life. It's never just you, ever, ever, ever just you, as opposed to painting or drawing or something. Um, and the most honest form of filmmaking is to make a film for yourself. I can't say that I've, that I've ever made a film trying to please someone else, ever. And don't do it with your art. Um, I would recommend don't do it with your own art. Do something you love, you want to express for yourself that you want to see. Um, and that's really when the good stuff is made, when you're making it for yourself. Um, just some questions to ask yourself. What is your favorite movie, your favorite director, your favorite screenwriter? I'd love to go around the class and ask everybody, what's your favorite movie? That would be awesome because I just like talking about that. But I guess I can't do that. You can talk to me afterwards if you want to. But these are questions to ask yourself because 
watching your favorite movie. What is it about the movie that I really like? Why do I like it? Who's your favorite director? Find out who's directing these movies. Instead of just going to the movies, find out who the director is. Find out about their career and the things they've done. Um, that'll help you a lot, and it'll help you to understand in the, why you might like something or what you have in common with that director. Your favorite screenwriter, it's the same thing. Uh, screenwriters, usually they're kind of at the bottom of the totem pole, which is, I think, really odd because it starts with the screenplay. Uh, you can't have anything without a screenplay. It's like it's the blueprint for a skyscraper. You can't build a skyscraper without a blueprint. You can't make a film without a screenwriter or a screenplay. Okay, vision. This is what I'm going to talk about today is your vision. How, do I have a lot of time? Oh, okay. I'm going to slow down now. Okay. Vision. What is vision? Does anybody have an idea of what I, I say when I say vision? Like an idea? Yeah, that's one of the things. Yeah. And we'll go over it. Yes, that is part of it. So what is vision? This is one of my favorite movies of all time, by the way. There Will Be Blood. You'll see it a few times pop up because I couldn't resist. Um, Daniel Day-Lewis is my favorite actor. Paul Thomas Anderson is probably my favorite director. So there's a couple of my favorites, so you know. Okay, now this, this quote comes from John Truby who wrote a book called The Anatomy of Story. It's, um, it's, a, it's about crafting screenplays. He does like 22 steps. There are a lot of different uh, ways to write a screenplay, but he has a particular way too. But I like his quote here, and he, he's referring to screenplays and the story, but I think it, goes, it can go beyond that. He said, as you study your work and your tendencies, key patterns will start to emerge about what you love or the things you're drawn to. This, in the rawest form possible, is your vision. Um, so like key patterns could be certain themes that you like to explore, certain colors, um, certain ideas. I'm gonna take a sip of water, sorry. My mouth gets dry when I talk too much. That's why I don't talk much. Okay. What does a vision consist of? Now, a vision can consist of a whole gamut of things, like so many different things, but I'm only going to cover three things today. And if you have any questions afterwards, we can, uh, we can talk about what some other things might be. Um, okay. Color theory in film. Now, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert on color theory, but... Um, I have used it a little bit, and it plays a very important role. Uh, you can see down here at the bottom left, there's a movie called 12 Years a Slave. You can see the color patterns there, how they go from black all the way to the dark green. And you can see in the image all those colors, and they complement one another. Uh, and it's, so it's not just a simple shot of her sitting there making a doll. There is color involved in that shot. We'll go a little further. So in, in film, and it might be the same for the other arts. Color theory states that different colors have the power to elicit emotional response from the audience. By manipulating colors, you can instantly create a mood for your film, thus helping to tell your story. So color helps create mood, helps enhance emotion, same as music does. Uh, so David Fincher, he uses a lot of, uh, a lot of warmer colors, but I guess kind of toned down a little more. This here is Django Unchained. You can see the gamut of colors he uses there. Um, this is a movie, who knows what this movie is? The Revenant. the Revenant? Yes. Thank you for knowing that. That's cool. Now, what do you notice about, what does anybody notice about the, the color usage here? That's a broad question, but can you, can you put your finger on anything? They're all cool colors. Right, right. And it's set where? In the snow, it's out west. It took place in 1823. But the filmmakers here made a conscious decision. We're going to go with cool colors and the color grading. Because what would have happened if he would have went with orange or, or something brighter? You wouldn't have had this really cool, you know, landscape like this. So the color makes a difference. Same with uh, this movie. What movie is this? Mad Max. Yes. You see what he did. So it, it makes sense, you know. It's, it's something we don't really think about when we go to the movies, but, you know, maybe when you go to the movies now, you'll look at it and go, okay, 
let's see what they did there. And that was, that was super color graded. This, this, when he, the original raw cuts of this film look nothing like this. So if you ever want to go look at color grading or color theory in film, you can watch all kinds of videos that will show you exactly the process the directors are going through and the cinematographers. And, w and Wes Anderson, uh, he has a lot, of, a lot of fans, so, and his stuff is very distinct, uh, very colorful. Okay, so the second thing, uh, is there any questions right now about color theory? I might not be able to answer because I'm not a color expert, but maybe Stacy can. No? Okay, cool. Uh, storyboarding. Um, it's the plan of the film, shot by shot in drawings. So when people storyboard, they typically will go, they'll lay out a scene, okay? They'll go by the script and say, this is what happens. And the director is envisioning, hey, um, this is what I want the camera to see. So he'll go from, we'll start with a shot here, the shot will move over here, and then we'll get this shot, this shot, and this shot, all within one scene. And that's what storyboarding is. So that it's a pre-visualization is what they call it. So that when you go and you're, you're on the day of shooting, you're not wondering what your next shot is. You're not, you're not like, okay, let me, let me go to the side and think about you know, how to capture this scene. No, as a director, it's your job to know how you want to capture it. Um, now, there are some directors like Steven Spielberg um, and myself. I mean, I'm no Spielberg, obviously, but he doesn't like to storyboard. I don't personally like storyboarding because, for one, I like to spend my time in pre-production on other things, uh, like really getting the story right, which you're not wrong for doing storyboards. I think it's an amazing thing to do, and it really helps. But I feel like if I know the story well enough going into it, I can get on set and I can shoot the film and not have a second thought about what I want my shots to be. But some people really love to do storyboarding, and I think it's a great thing. But anyway, uh, this is a storyboard of the shower scene in uh, Psycho. Has anybody seen Psycho? Yeah, it's a great movie. And if you, if you watch this film, like, I don't remember how many cuts were in that scene. It might have been a hundred and something quick cuts. And he storyboarded every bit of it. Alfred Hitchcock was an avid storyboarder. Um, and that's why his films are, look so meticulous, like he planned everything. Uh, does anybody know what this movie is by chance? Might be a hard one. It's one of my favorites. No Country for Old Men. It's a Coen Brothers film. So, uh, see, it's, they storyboard everything too. Everything the Coen brothers do. They will not, they will not deviate from the storyboards on set. Another one, now these storyboards, I put this up here in as an example because it says what scene it is, what shot within the scene it is, and the action the character is committing. So, yeah, that's really it. Uh, and I put this up here for Stacy because she loves Guillermo del Toro and the Cabinet of Curiosities. Uh, and their art show, by the way, which is still hanging in the Cultural Center. Uh, this is a storyboard from Pan's Labyrinth drawn by del Toro himself. He is also an avid storyboarder. He is very meticulous with the way he plans his films. And if you watch his movies, you will go, yeah, yeah, I get it. Uh, and I wanted to put this up here like this because that is a real storyboard that a real director drew. It doesn't have to be that. If you got this, your cameraman, your cinematographer, they know what you want. You want the girl's face in the middle of the frame, and you want the knives behind her. So the guy, who, the guy who made this film, his name is Ryan Johnson. He's an incredible filmmaker, and those are his storyboards. So he did the second Star Wars movie in the new trilogy and he did Knives Out 1 and 2. He's done several other films and he always storyboards his films like that. And they're brilliant. Okay, uh, that's enough of storyboarding. We're gonna go on to, does anybody have questions about storyboarding? Nope, am I good, Stacey? Yeah, you're good on Tom. You'll have uh, 30 minutes. <laughs> Goodness, stop making me talk so fast. Well, we still have the sketchbook. Hmm. So. Okay, might have plenty of time for that. I was trying to rush through this. I didn't know if I'd have enough time. Okay, story theme. Okay, this to me is the most important part. 
I'm not saying that as a fact, I'm saying that as an opinion, and from all the work I've done, um, it has served me the best. Knowing the theme of your film or the theme of your artwork. Uh, even your artwork has themes. Story theme is the film's central unifying concept. A theme evokes a universal human experience that can be stated in one word or short phrase. Example, love, death, coming of age. Sometimes it goes even deeper than that, like um, you know, love lost, um, dealing with death, um, uh, coming of age, while somebody's dying, I don't know, whatever. But you, you kind of get the point. Uh, my absolutely favorite book is, I mean, as far as filmmaking goes and writing is Story by Robert McKee. If you are ever wanting to write stories, uh, make films, write books, uh, get this book. I can't recommend it enough. He is, he is a guru, and even Hollywood screenwriters will go to him to learn. And he's not even a screenwriter. But he understands story so deeply that he's a great teacher. And he gets a lot of his concepts from Aristotle, who wrote a pamphlet called Poetics. And Poetics is, it was Aristotle's version of this is how you tell a story, kind of. So, and we've been telling stories the same way ever since, really. We don't know of any other ways right now to tell a story other than the way Aristotle laid it out. But yes, get that book. You will be happy you did. And I think even if you want to understand movies better, uh, if you want to understand books better, read it because it's, it's the same things. A, true, uh, a quote I like that, he, that was in his book is, uh, he says, true character is about the characters. Uh, true character is revealed in the choices a human being makes under pressure. The greater the pressure, the deeper the revelation, the truer the choice to the character's essential nature. Um, I can maybe give an example of this. And I can't say that I'm a huge Marvel fan, but I can respect what they're doing. And I did like the most recent two Avengers films. I thought they did a great job with their themes and, the, and Thanos. Thanos was, in my opinion, um, an astounding villain, incredibly well written and, and presented because of this, um, because of the choices Thanos made. He had an idea, he had a belief, he had an understanding of what he had to do. I hope I'm not spoiling it for anyone. His idea was to balance out the universe by eliminating half the population of the entire universe. He truly believed that, and he was put under great pressure to do so. And then that pressure forced him to do what he had to do, and the greater revelations were the revelations he was willing to sacrifice his daughter and many of the other decisions he made. And so you understand the character's true nature, and which, was, which is what makes him such a um, formidable villain. I can't believe I said that about Marvel. Goodness gracious. <laughs> Sorry, guys. All right. Okay, other themes that you can explore. Um, greed. Uh, the first Wall Street film, which is great, by the way, if you've never seen it, and The Wolf of Wall Street with Leonardo DiCaprio. I'm not allowed to recommend that to you guys. Um, but it's a great movie. And uh, what's the one in the middle? There Will Be Blood, one of my favorite movies. Uh, another theme is family. You wouldn't look at The Godfather and think, oh, this film's about family, would you? I mean, initially. You know, people might, oh, it's about gangsters, it's about, you know, it's about killing and, 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 and greed, it, when it's really not. It's about family. The, the father dies and the son is forced into the family business. And it's all about taking care of your family. That's what this film is about. The whole trilogy is about taking care of your family. It's not about being a gangster at all. So if you ever watch this movie, think about that. Um, addiction. Uh, the most recent film that you know, could think of about addiction is The Whale. He has an, e he has an addiction to eating. Um, Leaving Las Vegas is a film that came out in 1995. Nicolas Cage's character decides to drink himself to death. That's his mission in the film and he succeeds. 
And on the right, that's Leonardo DiCaprio and Mark Wahlberg. That's from a film called Basketball Diaries. Uh, Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio plays a basketball player who gets addicted to drugs. Uh, of course, it never ends well. And social justice. There are a lot of films about social justice, especially lately. And that is a theme also. So, Okay. Communicating your vision. Any questions about theme? No? Okay. Has anybody ever heard of a lookbook? It's sort of, you have? Yeah, it's, it's sort of like a sketchbook, I mean, really. Um, except it's more geared toward filmmakers, or it's what we call it. So a lookbook can be a slideshow, it can be a literal book where you tape and glue stuff in and draw things like Guillermo del Toro does his lookbooks. Um, like if you have a certain texture you want in your film, you'll tape something there that has that texture. It's a lookbook is something where a director is able to um, let the people he's working with know the vision he has. Uh, it can be stills from other movies that you're influenced by. Hey, I want, my, I want my movie to look like this movie. Okay, put stills like that in there. And then it lets your cinematographer know, hey, I know what I'm, I know what I'm going for when we set up the camera. And it lets your color grader know, hey, I know what he wants or she. Uh, drawings, same thing. You can put drawings in a lookbook. You can have a sketchbook. Uh, film stills, pieces of music. I find pieces of music to be the most helpful for me as far as communicating my vision. And when I say pieces of music, I don't necessarily mean, um, you know, Beyonce or Metallica or something like that. I'm, I like to find uh, pieces of music that were composed for films, past films. And when I'm, a when I'm able to present a piece of music to the people I'm working with, they know exactly how I want the film to feel like uh, emotionally. Who do you communicate your vision to? Okay, so there's, there's a massive crew on your films. You have to know who you're gonna communicate to uh, because you're not a cinematographer, you're not a storyboarder, you're not the writer, or the costume designer, or the production designer. You're the director. The director is the head of the vision. So all things come through the director. So if, if there's any creative decision made by someone within the crew, that decision has to be run by you as the director. And, and you say yes or no. That's the way it works. Okay, so when it comes to color palettes or color theory, you're really wanting to communicate that to your cinematographer. A cinematographer, by the way, if you don't know, is the person who operates your camera. They're the person who, they know what look you're going for, so they help achieve that by their expertise of the camera. Um, your production designer. Your production designer is the person who will design your sets. Uh, if there are not sets, let's say it's set out in the west in the desert, your production designer will work with the location scout to say, hey, I like the way that mountain range looks. It's very conducive to the director's vision. So yeah, even the production designer has a hand in sets. Uh, they'll design the sets and then on down under the production designer will be like a set decorator and props, uh, props and props assistants and everything like that. And you also communicate color scheme to your costume designer. Why? Anybody? Oh, you're not raising your hand. You're scratching your nose, you liar. Um, you want to communicate to the costume designer because your characters are going to wear costumes. And those costumes need to be a certain color if they're going to uh, uh, match your color scheme. Uh, okay, so your theme. Your theme absolutely has to be uh, communicated to the producers because the producers are the ones helping you get everybody on board. They're helping with the money. They need to understand what in the world you're doing. Your actors and actresses. They need to understand your theme because they need to know the road they need to travel as a performer. They need to know, does the way, is the way I'm performing this scene work with the theme of family? Does it work with the theme of greed, et cetera, you know? Uh, and then your editor. 
the unless you know if you're not the editor if you have a hired editor that editor is going to need to know the theme so that when they edit the the scenes together they have an idea of what each scene needs to flow toward the theme it needs to flow toward and storyboarding you want your cinematographer and your editor involved because your editor is going to want to know shot for shot what you like to do because they're the ones cutting together and your cinematographer obviously um, they need to know what the shots look like and these people help you bring your vision to life that's why Orson Welles said a filmmaker needs an army um, now I will say uh, I have made films uh, short films to where it's been mostly me which you can do if you know how to do most of the jobs you can make a film without needing a hundred people uh, the most recent film I made is called Let It End Here. It's a revolutionary short film. It's about 40 minutes long, but I did not have a single experienced filmmaker on my crew. There were maybe 20 of us, and I led and guided everybody toward exactly what they had to do in their own department. So if you learn how to do everything, that's a tall task, but over time, learn a little bit at a time, you know, you'll be able to get it. You can teach others and they can help you make your film. So it's, it's not, you don't need a million dollars. If you have this, you can go put it in horizontal mode and shoot a film. You really can. And there are even feature films now made where it's shot on iPhones. Uh, you can find several of them on YouTube and they don't look any different than something shot on a red camera or an Ari Alexa, which are Hollywood standard. So if you have a camera, if you have people that are willing to be in front of the camera and someone willing to help you move some lights or run around for you, you can make a film. Uh, and that's how I started doing it with my phone. And I learned more and more and more and more and then I, you know, I'm up to cameras and a crew. So it's really how determined you are and how much you love doing it and how much you want to tell your story. And there are people that are willing to help you. Okay, what is your vision? This is where we get into the sketchbooks. Does anybody have questions as far as vision goes? Okay, cool. There, there are a million other things I could have touched on as far as filmmaking goes, but with very limited time, um, I feel like this kind of gets, you know, it gets kind of to the heart of the matter and it helps guide your sketchbooks. Now what I want you to do is there are a few different things you can do. Well we have magazines back there if you want to uh, but we also have here I'll start with this. These are storyboards you have them already. You can or you can come up here and get another one if you've written all over yours. If you want to you can come and you can cut out a um, storyboard or a few of them and kind of draw a scene out you know, what shots you think would be neat in a scene. You don't have to lay an entire scene out, but you can kind of get an idea there. Maybe it's a close-up of a character. Um, maybe it's a car chase. But you can also come and take a look at these two books here, Master Shots. These are very helpful with figuring out what kind of shots are, you know, really good. Like over the shoulders, close-up, medium close-up. And it, you know, you can see, you know, it shows camera movement and everything. So come take a look at these. Um, Check out the other books, Psychology for Screenwriters, Crafting Short Screenplays That Connect. Anyway, um, also you could go back there and get a magazine and find different images that communicate what your vision might be for a film. Uh, whether it be the colors of costumes, uh, the landscapes, uh, anything like that, and have at it. And if you don't, if you don't necessarily have a story in mind, could always take like a just something simple like a fairy tale like little red riding hood and then go from there so if you don't necessarily have a story or you've written a story or, or don't have an idea you can always borrow from from someone just to yes no project. thank you very much for that yes I, did, I didn't mention that but uh are there any questions about that no all right
Composition is really 